Frank Saravalli, our insider from Daily Faceoff, who, were you drinking a ginger ale before hopping on? Canada Dry. Canada Dry. Woo. You're welcome. It's uh, it's good for dry January. I mean, it is the middle of the workday, but uh, yeah, dry January sponsored by Athletic Brewing. Other way. There they are. Uh, Yes, Athletic Brewing. We have a couple of cases around here, and I plan on. Oh, we we casually sip on those all the time. I I really like them. (laughs) It looks like you guys could have used a couple of them when you were in Vegas on the nation vacation. Oh, it would have been good to mix one in into the into the rotation for sure. Yeah, that maybe we would have been feeling a little bit better still today if we had mixed in a few I athletic was, brewing pots. I was going to say, Jay, are you still in one or what? You look like you're hurting. No, no, I, I had bronchitis for the last three weeks. So this is like, so I've been coughing on stop. I think Vegas actually, as we talked about, might have actually expelled this illness from me. Mm-hmm. That's usually how those things I'm work. I'm still coughing, not as much. It was bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get into the hockey talk for today. Uh, Vander Kane back in the lineup tonight, Frank. And with that, Kyler Yamamoto has been placed on LTIR. The Oilers making both of those moves official about 12 minutes ago. Um, but they kind of got lucky with Yamamoto having to go on IR or getting to go on LTIR here, Frank. Otherwise, there may have been some tough decisions for Ken Holland to make. Yeah, and Tyler, to be honest, they were in the process of trying to figure out their cap situation and make those tough decisions last week, knowing that Kane was on his way back before Yamamoto ultimately got hurt. And that really set the table for what should be. And I think the Oilers are hoping for a nice reset for Yamamoto to get healthy one, because he's been dealing with a number of different injuries over the course of this season has not quite looked right from both a play and point production standpoint. And also just a mental reset at the same time. While you're out, get a chance to get right and hopefully come back on the other side of the All-Star break. He's eligible to return to the lineup on February 12th. Uh, And at the same time, you're able to kick the can down the road on that decision-making process for cap compliance. They will have to make a move if when Yamamoto is healthy and eligible to return, everyone else remains healthy. That's not a guarantee or a given. And because of that, The Oilers were out there last week gauging trade interest. Specifically, uh, their options to waive were Derek Ryan, Warren Fogle, or Yessa Pugliarvi. None of those three names are really going to shock you. Uh, But they were gauging the trade market on um, Fogle and Pugliarvi specifically. And I'm told that a handful of teams had reached out to the Oilers to engage them in discussion on Pugliarvi because... Um, I think a lot of people were wondering if the Oilers might have to attach an asset in order to entice a team to take on Pugliarvi, but there seemed to be a healthy amount of interest from teams around the league that think they might be able to jumpstart Pugliarvi. I'm sure this question is going to be coming in our Nation Network YouTube chat. Was legitimate interest in Pugliarvi right now, and you know you're going to have to move him likely at some point when Yamamoto's healthy, why wouldn't you just pull the trigger on that now is kind of my response to that. You know, like why run the risk that something happens in the next three weeks that makes him back to being an unmovable asset, back to something you have to attach? Well, I think there's two things at play here. And I think it's the old, if you have time, use it um, standpoint. And so the Oilers found an opening and why make a decision before you have to? Because you, you don't know what's going to transpire. So one is the injury front. Um, You don't know what your lineup is going to look like uh, on the other end of this. That's the first thing. And I think the second thing is we're right in the middle of pro and amateur scouting meetings. The Oilers held their amateur scouting meetings in Vegas, actually, while you guys were there on the nation vacation. And they're going to do their pro scouting meetings, I believe, this weekend coming up. So uh, there's a lot on the go, I think, from just their own team internal standpoint. And then all these other teams... While there's interest, I don't think it ever got quite to the point of pulling the trigger. So, um, you know, I think that's sort of where they left it at the moment. So let's see what we come up with in our pro and amateur scouting meetings. Let's see where our list stands in terms of targets we'd like to acquire. If we can pick that conversation up again later on. Makes sense. It makes sense. You could also say that, I mean, if they want to bring back all of the players when they're healthy, you have to make one move. But also, Frank, there's an element of, you need to free up space ahead of the deadline too, right? And it probably is 
if you're an Oilers fan, encouraging an encouraging sign that there's interest in these guys because it could give Ken Holland a chance to not just survive the cap crunch, but maybe open up some space too, right? Yeah, and look, I, I think to be fair, I I, I believe I've seen enough from Yessa Poliarvi uh, to this point to have a really good grasp on what he is as a player. But I think there's always a fear in the back of any manager's mind or front office's mind that what happens if you trade Poliarvi and he goes on a tear and he he ends up finding his game? There was a really interesting piece. I'm not sure if you saw it from our friend Tommy Seppala in Finland over the weekend where he talked to Ole Jokinen and went through an entire path of, hey, this is where Poliarvi is at in his stage of his career. This is where Ole Jokinen was at in his stage of his career. And the numbers are actually very favorable to Poliarvi. And I think in the back of everyone's mind, they're saying, well, rather than be the team that gave up too soon on a player, what's another three weeks of, of you know, holding on to him going to hurt anyone? Yeah, I guess that's fair. Like, I definitely do see the logic there. And that is why we bring on Frank Saravalli for these kind of segments to give that us that insight. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to hit Frank with any of my silliness today. I wanted to be mm-hmm. very clean pro information because we mean business now. Yeah, we do. We're uh, back on the rails, baby. The Oilers have won three in a row, and the Pacific Division is starting to tighten up for a handful of reasons. The Kraken are just, I mean, they're red hot right now, even though they lost last night. Um, but the Vegas Golden Knights, Frank, is where I wanted to go with you as we take a look around the division here. They're starting to slip. They've now lost. Uh, the screen says two in a row, but they have an OT loss in there, too. So it's kind of like three in a row for the Golden Knights, and they're dealing with some injuries. Mark Stone, week to week, if he's out, that could, like, and I mean out in terms of LTIR, that could really change the landscape in terms of the trade deadline almost around the league, no, Frank? I, I don't know about the round the league, Tyler, but definitely the Pacific Division for sure. I think it's something that everyone would have to keep an eye on. And, you know, I'm told as Mark Stone is is regrouping from this latest injury that it is indeed a back injury. And I think that's certainly uh, scary news for the Golden Knights and their fan base given what he went through last year with his back um, and the procedure that also went on last year. And so I think they're in a spot where um, they're in wait and see mode, knowing that he's week to week. Obviously, he's not around the corner from returning. There's some fluidity there. I think they're trying to get a handle on exactly what the time frame may be. And I believe it's even too soon to have an answer to that question. And To your point, if he is out long term, and we mean maybe the season or up until the playoffs, well, I think that changes the conversation entirely for the Vegas Golden Knights, who have been totally capped out to this point. Um, If all of a sudden you have nine and and change million dollars in your pocket, that is a total 180 for one of the most aggressive teams in the league. So uh, they're in a spot where they can really go out and, and acquire a significant piece. And we know how aggressive Vegas has been in the past that I think that's certainly something that they would look towards if they had the opportunity to add. I mean, like, why wouldn't they? Like, it's they're in first place in the Pacific currently. I know I think Seattle's point percentage might be better than theirs. But anyways, they're they're up there. So they've got a little bit of comfort. And Stone's been out anyways. And it is a back. So you can easily say, you know what? You rest. We need you for the playoffs because – this is a back thing. We know it's a nagging thing. We know the ability for it to be re-injured. With that amount of caps, they could go get Horvat and Chikrin. Yeah, you could almost <laughs> get two guys at that like, price. That's crazy. They could really load Why up. wouldn't they? And then Stone comes back for the playoffs. We all know Stone's uh, the team runs through Mark Stone. He's now back to carry them through. Plus, they have these two assets to contribute. Like, scary as an Oilers fan. Well, I think it's also scary for a Golden Knights fan perspective of, okay, if this is another injury to Mark Stone's back, is it related to the previous one? And if it is, is this something that is really never going to go away? Is this something that's going to be hampering him for the remainder of his career? What's the reliability factor for Mark Stone, who, to your point, Jay, I think is quite clearly not just the captain, but the emotional leader's team. I think that they're a different team when he's not playing. So... Uh, to me, that really stands out as a huge question mark. Yeah, you can go out and be aggressive and you can go and trade for this guy and that guy. There's an asset limitation to that as well. Like there's only so many assets you have to go around to trade um, that I think they're also bumping up against. But they've that's been the story of the Golden Knights and their their franchise existence is how aggressive they've been on just about every front, whether it's now being on their third coach 
or whether it's spending to the cap and well above it, uh, going out and trading for Jack Eichel, getting Alex Petrangelo, like they've smashed that go for it button every single time. And probably for good reason after getting to the uh, Stanley Cup final in their first year of existence. The other team in the Pacific that has just been an absolute soap opera this season is the Vancouver Canucks. Jim Rutherford comes out yesterday and gives a wild media veil that delivered a handful of great quotes. Um, but the big name there is Bo Horvat. You've obviously connected uh, the Oilers to him before, saying that that's a guy who'd be a decent fit. That was like a few months ago, I believe, as well. Um, but the deadline preview up at dailyfaceoff.com right now. Every day, the countdown, you're picking a new deadline story to talk about. Uh, the Canucks and their deadline strategy. How many sellable assets do you really see with this team? And I guess the second part, is Horvat more or less a lock to be moved in the next six weeks here? I think Jim Rutherford all but kind of confirmed that he's on his way. And it's also the way that he described it. It wasn't just, we've made our best offer to Bo Horvat. There was also kind of, at least I viewed it this way, and I'd be curious to see if the Horvat camp did as well, which was, He's essentially having a season that's, if you're parsing through it, a statistical outlier and he wants to be paid for it. Meaning we felt like we put together an offer that includes up to uh, his work before this season, which has been magical. And essentially we're not paying anything on top of that for the season that he's had. So I actually understand a stance like that, that a team would make, uh, particularly one that has the cap issues that the Canucks have and are trying to chart a new path forward and need to find cap flexibility, the last thing they can do is afford to lock themselves into a contract where they're overpaying Bo Horvat to stay uh, based on the year that he's had. And so that's a question, frankly, that a lot of teams are wrestling with right now. You see Bo Horvat and the goals that he's piled up on pace for 60, on pace for 40 even strength goals. I think 10 of them have been deflections. It's been a wild year, and how does he replicate or duplicate that next season and beyond when he's sort of always been a 25 to 30 goal, 55 to 60 point scorer in a pretty long track record that we have to point to for sample size? So maybe those changes that he made with Adam Oates in his game have been um, you know, truly lasting, and, and if so, Adam Oates, whatever he's getting paid from Bo Horvat is certainly not enough. But moving forward, do they have sellable assets? Of course they do. It starts in the first point that we make in our um, daily face-off deadline countdown story today is their top objective is to maximize the value for Bo Horvat in the return. Get as much as you can. And here's where it really gets interesting for Vancouver. Jim Rutherford reiterated in his press conference on Monday that they don't necessarily only want draft capital, that they want young players with pedigree, that have maybe gotten off to some tough starts in their career that are 25 years of age and under that they could plug in and help with a retool, not a rebuild. So that's the we first objective. Tools. Second. Yeah. Well, Hey, go ahead. Um, and, and I, you know, it's funny you said that Jay, cause I was wondering at the beginning of the season, way before he went on this tear, uh, the guy you're wearing on your sweatshirt there would like, the term for Ryan Nugent Hopkins and the swap for Bo Horvat make any sense, given that the first offer that was made from the Canucks to Bo Horvat's camp was an actual copy of Ryan Nugent Hopkins' current contract, eight times 5.125. We know they're comfortable with the contract. Nuge is from Vancouver. Does that make any sense? And then now Nuge is on track for a 90 point season that kind of no one ever saw coming at this age. And he really truly is the number one power play specialist in the league. Yeah, that was your archetype ranking in terms of players who are purely power play producers. You had RNA ranked as number one. Uh, Frank, this stuff is awesome. I don't know if we have necessarily a power play producer on our Tourism Jasper, Jasper Pond Hockey Tournament team. There are no power plays when it comes to pond hockey. Comes from the back end. Comes from the back end, though. And Frank that's Saravalli. Our number one Directing the pond hockey play from the blue line. So here's the thing. I have two things to ask you about the pond hockey. One, I did barn burner yesterday, and they're actively trying to recruit me to their team. They're saying, come to the, the good side, the proper side, and hang with the Flames Nation guys. So I'm going to throw that out there. They said, what's it going to take to get you to come over to our team? And I'm not a mercenary, so I'm not up for sale. Yes, 
play us for it, barn burner. Oh, Let's do a okay. without Frank sitting aside. Let's we'll go five on five with barn burner. Winner gets Frank. Oh, we'd wipe them. Well, exactly. Yeah. So, like, Frank, don't you like to be with winners? Uh, it's all I do is win. Well, there we go. My other okay. argument would be, Frank, don't you need a ride to Jasper? <laughs> <laughs> they can't drive you from Edmonton. <laughs> Well, see, here's the thing. I actually originally, when I was going to book my ticket, was to fly to Calgary because I could get a nonstop. But then I realized that the ride was a little bit longer. Oh, Calgary to Jasper. Yeah, yeah. And we have some business to take care of, including some shows and podcasts. But So I want to just lay that out there because they were actively trying to recruit me. I, I respect second, it. Yeah. I need a stick because I realize that I am not going to pack. I'm going to pack my gear, but I don't want to check a bag. So I'm not going to, you know, just put one stick through the old baggage claim. So Tyler, as a fellow lefty, I'm going to need a stick. And hopefully you've got some nice composite material for me. I have a Sherwood uh, 59, whatever. Uh, 50-30. Yeah, 50-30 ready to go for you. But yes, Frank, I can throw in a stick into this deal. So that is no problem for me at all. Um, there you go. The negotiations I are I want to throw in one. Uh, I want to oh, throw one in one more? more thing now that I thought of this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys have decided to make this a family trip. Well. And I feel like the Flames guys are doing it right in that this is a true boys weekend. And so I just wanted so, to just chide you a little bit and give you some subtraction points on this scale because I get while, <laughs> you know, nation vacation, you got to keep everyone happy in the family. You got to keep the ladies happy. But come on, really? Frank, 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 Frank. The, this is what the beauty about a pond hockey tournament at the Jasper Park Lodge in January. Your girlfriend or your wife, all they want to do is hang around the beauty of that property, and they don't give a shit what you do. They say, you go play pond hockey, you go hang with your buddies. I am so happy to be here. It's a win-win situation. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a boy's trip in disguise, and you get hmm. credit for the family trip. Hmm. I'm also bringing I'll, an I'll insurance be the judge of that. I've got my daughter coming. i got my dog coming, but the big thing – I got my daughter's grandparents coming. So this has been well thought out. I am I am just, I have just, the brownie points have just been, uh, the tally is huge from this. And it's at the JPL. It's beautiful. It's a win-win. Okay. So it's, Barber guys actually doing it wrong. They could be getting brownie points and yeah. be going having a fun trip with, with, with the crew. But they're deciding to just go crew first and leaving family at home. It's risky. Mm. You get a lot of brownie points from the That's JPL. Sad. I have decided to drive with Tyler and Amber. Ah, there let's go. go. Uh, our guy, Uncle Carrie, is in and says, Frank can be enticed with a nice, fine Italian red. Ooh, there you go. Maybe that's something we throw into the offer. Yep. I hope mm-hmm. Carrie should yeah. come. Carrie. Red wine lifestyle. Thanks. I'm in. All right. Well, Carrie is the, 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 the grand pooba of the red, line, <laughs> red wine lifestyle. All right, we do have to wrap this bad boy up because it's a short for giant game day. Frank, thank you for your insight. As always, we'll chat again. See you guys next Uh, week.